everybody. This is Jason Augustus Newcomb, and, and I'm doing Inside the Magic Circle. And my guest today is actually probably someone who requires no real introduction for the vast majority of you, though for, for um, some of you, he has been an author and a, um, a leader within the occult community, particularly the Thelemic community, for oh many decades at this point. And frankly, this is the one person who I'm going to be interviewing in this whole series who is 100% responsible for my entire career, <laughs> whether whether he wants to acknowledge that or not. Um, my, when I first submitted my book, sort of colds to the publishing company, uh, Redwell Wiser, or Wiser at the time, um, he was the person who sort of said, yeah, this looks like an okay guy. He's looking an okay book. You might want to publish this. So I would not have published my first book, which at the time was called um, uh, the, the Knowledge and Conversation of Your Holy Guardian Angel, and it eventually became 21st Century Mage. Um, that book would not have been published, most likely, if it weren't for this this fellow's uh, intervention. And not only that, but he also wrote a, an introduction or, or foreword to my second book, The New Hermetics. So um, again, uh, his name probably sells uh, more copies than mine does <laughs> to this day. Uh, so um, if you're still wondering who this is, my guest today is uh, Lon Mila Duquette. How are you doing today, Lon? I'm doing fine, thank you. It is such thank a pleasure to talk to you. I'm, I'm, I'm proud that you think that I've had something to do with your 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 great work. I'm 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 honored. Well, I mean, I mean, frankly, honestly, you know, with the way things work in this world, if it weren't for you, I don't think it would have gone forward. I'd already been rejected by somebody else. So, you know, it was your it was your uh, your kind words to you know whoever you talked to at Wiser that 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 made it happen. They they let me know that when they gave me the contract, they were like. This wouldn't have happened if it weren't for Lon Duquette. So oh. you know, like, it's not a secret. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, but, but this is about you, not about, not about my nonsense. Um, so, um, you have been a part of the occult community since uh, the the '60s, I would say, probably most likely. Um, but I want to, I want to delve into an aspect of your life that I've never heard anyone talk about. Maybe you have, and I just haven't, I haven't noticed it. But um, you were part of a group called Charlie D and Milo, who released a uh, an LP through Epic Records in 1970. Um, and and not only that, but um, because I've we've uh, my my friends and I have seen them repeatedly. Uh, uh, there are a lot of radio copies of your single um, that that are that are still floating around in the world. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about that experience. What what what? Um, you know, where, where were you at when you were in that group, and 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 how did that come about? You got to deal with Epic Records. Yeah, uh, it was an accident. Uh, like, who was, like, who was like, the line Duquette that got you your record contract with Epic Records? <laughs> uh, well, I uh, I don't know the. I was a musician, like in high school, you know, in. Uh, uh, I graduated from high school in 1966, before your grandmother was born. <laughs> Hardly, but okay. Thank you for that. That's very kind. And uh, uh, I went to high school in Nebraska, which uh, the if you truly graduate from high school in Nebraska, you graduate and leave the state. That's... That's what so it's, a, it's a requirement. They give you your diploma and they're like, yeah, look, you're too qualified to be in this state. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, but I, I had been born in California. I was, I was born in California. We didn't move to Nebraska until I was seven. So uh, uh, I, I always felt like an, uh, an outcast in Nebraska because uh, I was a Southern California kid and then Nebraska seemed very uh, medieval. It, I can imagine, especially, yeah. you know, back in the 1960s, because I, I was there in the 2000s in both of those places. And I would say Nebraska, with no offense to my many friends who live in Nebraska, still seems uh, different than, than Southern California in many ways. So, yeah, yeah I can imagine. It was uh, <clears throat> medievally provincial. <laughs> so so the, the, the village... Anyway, but anyway, to keep my sanity, uh, you know, I think I've got attention deficit disorder or so because I, I've uh, uh, I never paid attention in class I was always the class clown I was always in trouble they always checked that I failed uh, uh, 
what they called self uh, discipline. <laughs> One gets an F in self discipline. Uh, but uh, I, I, and I've only been interested, I always have only been interested in stuff that I'm passionately interested in. And then I go just whole hog, you know. Yeah. But, and the only reason that I graduated from high school was because uh, uh, very early on, even in grade school, they uh, I could they found out I could sing, and that I was a good sport, and I didn't mind performing in front of people. So the uh, vocal music department of the school system knew they could count on one person in the whole town. <laughs> <laughs> to get up and make a fool of themselves and, and not give a shit. And uh, it's interesting, Glenn, because I feel like one of the things that I have admired about you for, for decades is your ability to sort of um, charm people in a, in a very, you know, that you, you, when you're speaking, you do not seem like you're being arrogant or pretentious or, or speaking, you know, over people yet you seem very knowledgeable and people, laugh and, and have a wonderful time when you're when you're when you're presenting things i mean it's it's very it's, it's very entertaining to watch so that was something that was just like a part of you yeah that, that, that's just how just how i was and it was enough to get me uh uh through high school because uh the vocal music department uh head uh had the power of like a winning football coach because uh, he won all these state awards every year and, and stuff. So mm. uh, he bullied all my other teachers into giving me a C plus in all my subjects. And, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and that's how you became one of the most well-known occult scholars in the world? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, that's, ex that's exactly right. You hit the nail on the head. But so, anyway, in yeah. my, in, in my uh, uh, last three years of high school, I uh, uh, I had started a little band, a rock band. Every kid my age, sure, uh, had a rock band. I've been in a few. <laughs> and, uh, 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 but I I like to write a few songs uh, too. Uh, but anyway, the second I graduated from high school. I just made a beeline to Southern California, and uh, uh, there was this beer bar in Costa Mesa that my brother, my older brother, hung out in, and uh, they sort of ignored the fact that I was only 17, mm. you know, and uh, they didn't serve me beer, but I could go hang out there and shoot pool, and I, I pretended to go to college. I pretended I was going to college. Were you enrolled somewhere and didn't go, or just just act? Oh, no, I was in, I was enrolled because uh, the uh, Vietnam War was going on, and oh sure, you had to get you had to do that to get out of the war. I had to pretend to go to school, and I was a drama major, mm. which, which means uh, I only uh, uh, learned to act like I was going to school. <laughs> Sure. I was actually a drama major too, um, but I didn't graduate. Uh, did you graduate from college or no? No. You uh, dropped out as well? Yeah. Uh, I don't even know. I just stopped going. I forget. Uh, you, know, you don't even know what happened? Uh, Constance came out from Nebraska. We got, we got married and, and I, don't, I didn't even notice when I quit. <laughs> That's how engaged I was with college. But, so uh, th that was actually something I wanted to ask you about. You you've been involved for about uh, fifty years or so in the most notorious uh, sex magical cult uh, in history, and yet at the same time you have been married to the same woman since you were a young man. Um, so, like, why? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I guess the the simplest answer is sex magic cults aren't what you might think they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, tell me more. Right. You might not, <laughs> they, they might not be what you fantasize they, uh, they are. 
Um, By the way, just as a as an aside, uh, this is no aspersion against Constance, who's a, obviously a very attractive, <laughs> lovely woman who I can see why you would want to be married to. So I'm not that I, the, she was not a factor in my question. Just like you are, you have been, you've kind of been a leader and and a uh, a celebrity for a long time, and yet you you seem to have been kind of a a, a monogamous person. That's interesting. Um, I actually have written in my book about sex magic. Uh, you know about I, I've kind of. Uh, sung the praises of monogamy, but uh, <laughs> but uh, you know many people have have uh, said to me that's your your attitude is silly that monogamy doesn't make sense. So I'm just curious, as a person who's actually an authority, unlike me, um, you know wh wh what's your perspective on that? Well, uh, everybody's different. Okay, uh, sure. monogamy is not for everyone. Uh, as a matter of fact, it might be for very few. Um, but it, it's it, it's for people that realize that if you're miserable in one relationship, you're likely to be miserable in the next relationship too. I mean that I think that's pretty quotable right there, right? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> that's it. We're just we're just lazy and fear change, you know. Sure. Um, so, but uh, uh, it, it's it's not so much a philosophical. Uh, 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 decision, but uh, a matter of uh, of uh, taking the the path of least resistance uh, to uh, uh, provide uh, a life, an individual life for for uh, each of us that uh, allows us to pursue uh, what we think is uh, uh, otherwise our great our great work. And so uh, that's the same same attitude we have toward uh, 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 politics and, and and social things too. Uh, of course, we support the uh, those those policies that uh, uh, allow us to uh, personally uh, uh, arrange. Uh, an environment that allows us to be free to do what what uh, we think is important for us to do, and that's why uh, uh, that's why we you know we prefer not to live in uh, uh, an environment where our neighbors are starving to death or or in open rebellion or shooting each other and stuff like that so that's we support policies that uh, that uh help make the most people the most secure and happy and uh speaking, speaking of speaking of this subject um you you and I have a mutual friend uh of James Wasserman who uh recently passed uh and and someone who was who was very important to me in 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 my um you know, early spiritual life, and and I, and I think you knew him fairly well. Is that is that correct? Oh yes, yeah. Uh, Jim and I are old old friends, or we're old friends. He he had a very sort of different political perspective than I feel like a lot of people who I know and love had, <laughs> and, and and so how did that? How did you find that integrating into your life? I mean, especially since both of you are sort of within. The organization Ordo Templi Orientis, both of you have kind of a powerful, had kind of powerful positions. Um, did, was that something that, that you got to loggerheads about, or was that just sort of, uh, that's Jim, he's got his perspective, I've got mine? Uh, not at all. Uh, he and I didn't ever go go, uh, go at it, but all of our, our respective fans went at each other. Sure. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> I mean, the, the funny thing is, like, I, I knew when, when, when I was most sound very amusing. So, what? you both liked it. <laughs> <laughs> we both found it very amusing. Uh, but like I say, absolutely everybody uh, uh, is uh, is different, and uh, James and I come from uh, you know different different backgrounds, and both of us. Uh, uh, both of us were damaged and traumatized in our own particular ways okay that that uh, uh helped sh shape how we view the world and and uh and live our lives the the things that we that we 
held in common were really the important things, uh -huh. you know. Uh, and uh, uh, it, how, how we process, uh, you know, our, our point of view, how we process uh, uh, the transcendent liberty that uh, Thelema implies. Uh, well, we're, we're, totally, we're, we're totally different and still... And still uh, com compatible on some level, right? Well, yeah, it's compatible in the most important level. Yeah. The the challenge that I, the, I mean, the thing is, that I I feel like the period where we are in in our sort of cultural history right now is that people don't seem to be able to relate to each other very well when they have different points of view on on fairly simple matters that aren't necessarily all that important. And it seems like it's just getting worse and worse. And I I, I mean, I remember Jim sending me all kinds of stuff back in the mid nineties about, you know, that where he was, he was really getting interested, you know, like super, you know, uh, things that I didn't even necessarily totally disagree with. Like I, I'm, I support the second amendment and I support, you know, people's rights to, you know, assemble in the way that they want to and so forth. I'm, I'm not like, a, I don't disagree with Jim, but the people who Jim's perspective was turning on go so much more angry with all that stuff. And, and it seems like people are not like, how, how do we get along? Uh, well, we take we take care of ourselves first. <laughs> okay, it's uh, uh, in the in this particular uh, case, I I know exactly. Uh, I I think what you're talking about, and that broke our hearts too, especially uh, uh, when uh, some of our friends uh, are are so emotionally uh, invested in a philosophical point of view that uh, that others who support at least part of that point of view uh, turn out to be white supremacists or yes. or uh, uh, other unhealthy uh, extremes of uh, of that and uh, and uh, you know to uh, in all fairness, uh, uh, Jim was anything but a white supremacist. No, absolutely. I, 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 I yeah. And that's not anyone who would put, put who would put that he was a hateful person is not He's not, not looking at things correctly. A loving and, and dear souls, uh, but uh, uh, there's there's no de denying that that those who held. Uh, it, other social and economic uh, points of view uh, with him uh, are incredibly racist and incredibly intolerant and uh, and downright dangerous but uh, uh, you know it, you can't force uh, someone to be mature and you can't force someone to uh, uh, embrace common sense uh, rather than uh, uh, react to their fears and uh, uh, and such so uh, and uh, not everybody comes at all of this from a, a religious spiritual. Uh, uh, point of view, uh, and uh, I guess if if there's uh, any big danger in being as uh, uh, recognized or a public spokesperson for any uh, religious or social uh, uh, order, uh, you can't expect everybody to to uh, uh, appreciate. Uh, your particular uh, grasp of uh, of the philosophy that could just as easily be uh, easily twisted to to turn into something uh, uh, very ugly, uh, and, and the best example of this uh, is Aleister Crowley himself. Sure, absolutely. 
Now, the, uh, the, the more you actually find out about Crowley, uh, the more terribly amusing he becomes, his, his, uh, his life becomes, uh, because you can use his words uh, to justify a, a, a very fascist political point of view. And you can use his words and his behavior to uh, 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 justify an extremely uh, uh, liberal, uh, dare I say, radical socialist uh, sure. point of view, too. And the more you find out about actually what he did day to day, include, including uh, taking part in anti-fascist demonstrations <laughs> and things like that. Uh, you can find out, well, when he put his money where his mouth was, or when he put his borrowed money where... <laughs> his, where his, his, his gifts from, from, from uh, adoring fans, money that, that came into his pocket? <laughs> where you put it, when he put his stipend where, where his um, uh, mouth was, uh, and actually how, how he behaved in life, uh, then you can put the wild things he says on a on a philosophic uh, level in a in a more wholesome uh, and uh, healthy maybe not wholesome but healthy uh, uh, perspective. So I mean, to me, it seems like the the essence of his message in in this area that we're kind of you know skirting around here is that. Uh, you should absolutely feel free to be in charge of your life unless you're too stupid to be in charge of your life and then maybe you should let others be in charge of it for you. I mean, it seems, it seems like that's, that's basically the message, but it's hard to know whether you're the smart one or you're, you're not. That's the, right. that's the challenge. Well, the, uh, uh, we're faced with it uh, uh, day to day uh, during this pandemic, you know, uh, I enjoy going to movies and-, and uh, Me too, I miss it like anything, I gotta tell you. Uh, yeah, it's a big, big part of my, my, my life. It's, uh, but anyway, I, I love going to movies and I love sitting in the theater uh, uh, with other people, okay? I love other people's reaction and I, and I like them reacting uh, over my reaction at a, at a mm -hmm. theater, you know, because uh, I laugh at things that that, that uh, a lot of people miss, and and other people laugh at stuff that I miss. Or sure, uh, I mean that's that's one of the wonderful things about experiencing something together, and that's ultimately, in some ways, like that's what the mysteries and the initiations of 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 uh, for, throughout history are about it's about having a shared experience of something together right i mean realistically and, and i would really hate for for uh the the management of the theater to come in and say don't laugh so loud <laughs> you know i'd feel uh, now wait a minute this you know <laughs> Shakespeare wanted me to laugh, right? right. <laughs> Was Jim Carrey not wanting me to appreciate this right now? But I do not resent the manage, manager of the theater to tell me I can't jump up and yell fire. Sure. In that crowded theater. And I would, if somebody did, I'd be happy if they were arrested, fined for doing that. Put in sure. jail, hit in the face, <laughs> you know. You don't yell fire in a crowded theater. During the Blitz in London, during, during the war, sure, you should have the liberty to keep your lights on at night and your windows open. Sure. But you don't have the right to do it in a blackout. You <laughs> don't have a right, right you Absolutely. don't have the right to endanger a million people in your city by keeping the lights on in your house. Or even really just your neighbors. You don't have the right to make, to make the choice for your neighbors that they should become a target for the, for the bomber at all. I mean, like, you know, it's, it's, 
if and you that's, would, where the, that's where this pandemic thing and the people that are upset about having to wear masks and calling sure. it an individual uh, right. It may very well be that it, it doesn't help. I think it does. <laughs> right. No, no, no. I, mean, I, I agree. I, I'm 100% on board with what you're saying. And I think this is important. I think people need to realize it doesn't matter whether the masks work or not. We've made a collective decision. We don't all get to have a vote. I and mean, we all get to have a vote. But we don't all get to make the decision. We collectively, we've made a decision that we're supposed to wear masks in public for a while until this thing goes away. If three years from now, people are still wearing masks, listen, I, I'm going to be with you. Let's stop dealing it at that point. But like, you know, let's get past this. At, the, at that point, we can stop. By the way, here, uh, I want to show you something. This is going to be backwards or something on your screen, but this is, uh, there's, that's your uh, that's your single from 1970. Oh, so I that, that's a radio station. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. That's that's going. That's that's. This is these. You can get these on the internet. Someone sent this to me just because uh, they wanted they wanted me to see it. So, um, so let's go back to that moment. Uh, as much as I like talking about this, I do. I do. This is great. You know, I, I enjoy it. But I want to. I want to. I want a little bit more about your your. So you moved to California and you were and you were um, interested in music and, and so how did Charlie D and Milo come about? Okay, well I, I went to that bar, okay, and that bar was owned by a, by a, a guy from Texas who had a son who was a musician who had just returned from uh, uh, like a year in Hawaii where uh, where he like opened for Don Ho and things like that. Okay, yeah. Uh, but he's a folk singer type type guy, and and he wrote songs, and we became friends. This is Charlie D, Charlie D Harris. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, so we started writing songs, uh, and, and we both uh, uh, shared a great love for marijuana. Okay. <laughs> <We> were, <laughs> Are you saying that you got a record deal just because you smoked pot in 1969, 1970? Well, <laughs> it helped too. Okay. Uh, but anyway, we we, uh, we love getting stoned and uh, uh, writing songs. And some of them were pretty good. Okay. And, uh, you know, we're only about 40 miles from uh, Hollywood. And uh, somehow or other, we got uh, 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 a link to go to, to Hollywood and uh, uh, lay down a couple demos for, uh, it was Frankie Lane's brother. Okay, I don't Okay, know. yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Absolutely. Who had a little uh, publishing company. So we published a couple songs uh with sam lane and uh but anyway uh we could uh we had enough material and there were enough saloons in uh costa mesa newport beach area that we that we found work almost immediately and uh so uh do you think that was the product of the times, or do you think Charlie D and Milo could have could have uh, made it today? Like, would that have happened in the same way, or do you think that it was a, a different era? And well, probably, probably so. I mean, we just kept stumbling into one thing uh, after another, and we must have been pretty good. Okay, I, I was about to say that that's the story that genius frequently says is they just cre they just fell into a bunch of stuff. But like, yeah. there's lots of people who didn't do well who just weren't good so yeah most so, people that, that were much better than us didn't do as well as we did how did epic records take a look at you and how did you get noticed well it's like this uh uh constance and i uh eventually uh uh when she came out we got married and uh we dropped out we did the tim leary thing Sold everything. Moved influence, to, influenced by Tim Leary, or just that was what was going on, and you didn't even notice. Yeah, influenced by Tim Leary. Influenced because my mom did the same thing uh, a couple of years earlier than that. But yeah. yeah. And uh, so we moved to uh, uh, Southern Oregon, and uh, we're part of this sort of a little hippie community. And bought a quarter acre of land and built a little cabin, and uh, 
but we were only there for about six, seven months, and uh, uh, we ran out of money. So I threw the Yi Ching or something like that. I was already doing. That's what I wanted to ask you. How, how interested in the occult were you at the time that you became, you know, Charlie D and Lila Greer? Well, Charlie, Charlie and I wrote a lot of our songs by getting stoned and opening up an occult dictionary and bibliomancing a couple words. And we used that to jumpstart our uh, lyric or, or uh, jumpstart our song. This, okay, so, so the, your, your single that Epic released was uh, Love is the Word, right? Um, was no, that... the, the Word is Love. That's our the second. The Word is Love, sorry. That's, um, our, that's our second single. We did oh, okay. Two. What was the first single? Uh, the first one was uh, called uh, Back Bay Blue. Okay, but that doesn't sound as occult as the word is love. So, <laughs> how influenced was that by Crowley or anything like that, or was it just was it just happenstance that that word, the word is love, happens to sound kind of lemic oh, in some ways? Uh, well, that that was that was totally on a spiritual level. Yeah, we fancied ourselves as writing hymns, that every song was a metaphysical uh, 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 song. Everything had. Uh, if we were singing a love song, it was uh, uh, a Bhakti Yogi uh, 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 devotional song. We're talking about God, you know. So the B side of the word is love is, I think, Annie Moon. Was that was yeah. was that like was that Annie Besant and Moonchild? I mean, like how how how, how literary were, it were you? It was a Moon Moonchild, but it was Annie Bes uh, 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 Besant, but not. Only, only indirectly. Uh, okay. It was it, it was an astrology song, the okay. influence, influence of the moon, uh, talking with clams and stuff because clams have sex at a certain time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So is this a scoop? Have you have you told people about the clam nature of the Annie Moon song, or is this is this something you're? No. I, why spoil it for people? <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, no one will watch this, so we'll we'll uh, <laughs> we'll keep it up between ourselves. We came back to uh, we uh, uh, traveled back down to California just for two weeks. We left everything up in Oregon, came back down, uh, packed up our Volkswagen bus, just like the one I still drive. Uh, came back to California. I said, I'll get a job in a saloon and we'll uh, make enough money to get the supplies to build our second little cabin. And that's just what happened uh, the, the day or the evening that uh, we got back to Costa Mesa. I walked into the Buccaneer bar and there was a guy I'd never seen before. And he says, oh, you're Lonnie. Do you want to go to work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm here for. And and, uh, and and there weren't any occult rituals involved in that, or was that was it just sort of your your no. your happy spirit? Yeah. So uh, it's, it it seems like Constance uh, has has like followed a lot of your inclinations through a bunch of different sort of moods and periods of your life. Like what. Do you, is that just because you're charming, or what, <laughs> how did you make that happen with her? Uh, uh, well, it, it may see, appear like that on the outside that that she's gone along with everything, but uh, there's was not she a, guiding it? Was she? She was actually it, telling you what to do, right? Yeah, this is like uh, Ram Das said about his wife that uh, uh, she was the Buddha, and and he's just the Buddha's straight man or front man. I mean, absolutely. Everything I've done is because my wife was like, why are you not doing this already, yeah. Jason? So. Yeah, there's, uh, I, I'm constantly saying, what do I think about that? <laughs> <laughs> That's very familiar to me. Yeah. Right? But, but it, <laughs> She's right here right now. So. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, it was Charlie. He got me a job singing with my old partner who had oh, a... Okay. Who had a great job uh, at a very fancy restaurant uh, on an old steamboat in Newport Harbor, and uh, oh. so so uh, I started singing five nights a week 
with, with him, okay? And in two weeks, I'd saved up enough money to buy that material for our second house. We, <laughs> packed, we packed up the Volkswagen bus to, to move back to Oregon, and I sang one more Saturday night uh, at a club in Newport Beach, and two guys from Columbia Records Whoa. were in the restaurant, in the bar, getting drunk, celebrating their second gold record in 90 days. Wow. They were the producers of a group called The Spiral Staircase that had two number one selling records uh, within 90 days. I love you more today than yesterday. Sort of a blood, sweat, and tears kind of group, Columbia. So they were your lawn while you can. So <laughs> they got so drunk that we sounded good. <laughs> and, and the fact that we wrote all of our own stuff uh, was icing on the cake. Sure. And they said, we wanted, want you to do a demo uh, at CBS. And uh, uh, he says, we'll set it up for next week. And they were serious about it. But Constance and I were set to go to Oregon that night. We were going to start driving that night. And so I said, OK, I'll stay another week. Whoa. We'll stay another week. Charlie and I go to, to CBS, uh, go to Hollywood uh, a couple days later. We do a demo at the famous Studio A in, in uh, Columbia Center. They immediately sign us to, uh, uh, for two singles and an album. Amazing. And we never went back to Oregon. What was your first single called? First single was called Back Bay Blue. And that okay. one, that one was uh, 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 produced. Uh, we, let, we didn't have, uh, we let them have creative control over how that one was produced. Mm. Uh, and uh, we didn't like the way that that one was produced because someone else produced it besides us. and. And the person that produced it uh, uh, wasn't stoned all the time like we were. Right. <laughs> they, they had absolutely no creative inspiration whatsoever. <laughs> but there's, there's a 28 piece orchestra. Whoa. And, so it's a big song. And uh, the, believe it or not, uh, a studio musician at the time who we'd never heard of, uh, played guitar on, uh, on our session. Uh, and he made his guitar sound like a sitar because we wanted a sitar on this. Okay. Band. Yeah, sure. That was the, that was the it, thing at the time, right? You know, the sitar. Glenn okay. Campbell. What? The musician was Glenn. Glenn Campbell, Campbell played your pseudo sitar on your, on your, on your single. And before, but before he was, <laughs> yeah, before, <laughs> I had no idea who this guy was. You know? <laughs> was he? Was, it was good though. I, I haven't heard that song, so I don't. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not that great, obviously. Every time, you know, like, yeah, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, we, I think we recorded six songs, of which they took two. Uh, uh, so I think. I mean, one of the things that um, the person who wants to know the most about this uh, this aspect of your life. How much radio play did your singles get? Like how much? Like what? What was the sort of, you know? I mean, obviously, Charlie D and Milo didn't continue to another album, but you guys, you 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 clearly did enough stuff that there are a bunch of radio singles out there and so forth. So how much? Oh, yeah. How much? What 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 kind of an impact do you feel like you had on the music marketplace of that time period? Oh, you, you could know. Uh, uh, Google us and, and find the discussions of, of uh, m musician files discussing Charlie D and Milo and, and uh, such. The second single, The Word is Love, the one that you sh showed us. Yeah, that I've heard, yeah, yeah. Uh, went to number one 
in five market areas in the United States. That's great. So we've got good airplay. That's probably why I've seen that one. Yeah. <laughs> and so did you guys produce that one yourselves or, or have more influence uh, over the production? That, yeah, that's our band. That's us. That's, uh, yeah, we, we threw that one. Uh, uh, so I, I've got a, I've got a, one more question about the early Charlie D and Milo. Okay. So, um, you may you're probably gonna see where I'm going with this if if you remember your music at all. But um, the uh, are you, are you the no, cat I, I'm listening. I may have something to actually show you. Oh, okay. There you go. Whoa, that's awesome. That's a that's a copy of Billboard from that's Billboard magazine 1970. Is that March 28th, 1970? Whoa. And well, wow, people like the art was so interesting back then. I, mean, I can't believe that it's so that, like that is that is so different from the way people would do something right now. Whoa, that is that is wild. That, that's me. You are a good looking young man. I and, would have been super intimidated by you. Um, and uh, our, <laughs> our album got a billboard spotlight pick, and that's so amazing. The album, yeah, there, there's that thing in the. There we are. Yeah. Um. Hey, so, bring the camera around because I, I can't see you anymore. I'm looking at your all, your your bookshelves here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's so, that? Uh, perfect. Here's here's my question. J.K. Rowling it uh, has been accused of stealing a lot of her ideas from. Uh, other writers and other, you know, authors and so forth. But there's one person whose work has not been mentioned, and that is that you, on your LP, have a song called Mr. Muggles. <laughs> so the, if you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, muggle is a word that is credited completely to her. And yet your work is from... 26 years earlier than that so, do, you, do you feel do you feel like she may have heard your song and been influenced in some way or uh, well it, uh, we we did well first of all we did well in in uh, the UK uh, or we sold well in the UK the the, the album uh, do you, and, uh, so so has, has JK Rowling reached out to you and said uh, thank you Lon for giving me <laughs> No, uh, uh, not only that, but uh, Charlie and I chose the word muggles because that was uh, uh, a slang term for marijuana. Really? That's something that I have never heard before. From the, from the 20s, uh, turn of the centuries to the 1920s, you, you scored some muggles. Whoa, so, I, I literally have never heard that before. Do you think J.K. Rowling knows that? <laughs> she, is that literally something that she just stumbled into when she listened I, to your album? The reason why, why there might even be a possibility uh, is there's another song called uh, uh, Theme from Mount Oread in, mm -hmm. uh, on the album. Yep. And the lyrics go, sylphs and gnomes and undines to salamanders beckon you. Astrally, I think I've been here before. Right. And uh, so if she was doing any sort of just, uh, you know, farming around looking for occult sounding things, uh, that it's conceivable that that may have passed under her, uh, her nose. Just but, out of curiosity, is this a question you get asked a lot? Has anyone ever asked you that before? Or, uh... No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can accept that. It's like I, um, I like that. I'm okay, so... all about right on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, you, you like like you said, you've got you've got a, a, a occult themes in several of your of your songs from that album. Like, how involved in Crowley were you? Like, I mean, no, it, it was actually almost it was eight seven or eight years later that you got involved in OTO right it was yeah uh, well the the Oregon uh, our Oregon experience really got us deeper into uh, uh, things like the Yi Ching astrology 
but not magic per se. Uh, so who, who introduced you to that in Oregon? Just just various folks or was there some oh, everybody up there. It, it was just, it was just everybody was in there? We were all occult freaks. Okay. It's funny because that's my impression of Oregon from the several times I've been there, but I didn't realize it went back to 19. So, yeah. <laughs> so we were all, we were all, all us hippies were uh, 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 sort of a combination of, uh, we're all weirds, sort of griffins. We, we had the, the talons of Hindus and the beaks of Buddhists <laughs> and, <laughs> and psychedelic feathers and uh, uh, that is a very strong image <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it was all mixed up with flying saucers because you saw flying saucers every night you went out to look in southern Oregon uh, it was interesting. I just I just revealed my my flying saucers encounters a couple of weeks ago. My wife and I have seen a, a number of them here in Florida. But anyway, I don't want to get I don't want to get lost in that. Uh, so uh, how did you how did you end up uh, getting involved in Ordo Templi Orientis? Um, well, my brother, uh, who was six years older than I, uh, when he first went sober. Okay, like lots of lots of people, he had a terrible alcohol problem. And when he went sober, he joined the Rosicrucian Order Amork. Okay, okay. out of California. Yeah, and uh, he said, uh, and he encouraged me to do the same. And he was taking the lessons, and uh, uh, went to a local local lodge. Uh, if you're lucky enough in urban areas you that you can actually find a lodge to go to you know sure and uh and there is a strong connection between amark and, and alistair crowley truly i mean there's a that's this is uh, this is where i'm heading with this okay and uh uh he said they're sort of like mystic freemasons only there's women too you know <laughs> <laughs> but you were the uh, constance was a factor so that was oh like... yeah yeah <laughs> I'm so harmless. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, uh, I became active in Amork, and, and that's where I learned that uh, uh, I enjoyed uh, uh, getting robed up and strutting around in the dark. Yes, I know the feeling. Okay. And uh, sometimes uh, without a robe, right? Huh? <laughs> sometimes without a robe, even. Yeah. Just strutting around in the dark. <laughs> but but uh, uh, in Amork, uh, the convocation ceremonies, they look magical. They're not overtly magical, but uh, it, it's a group type uh, uh, lodge meeting convocation thing. And I became inner guardian, and then I was uh, uh, chanter, and then I was chaplain. And I really, I really liked uh, that. And I volunteered to uh, uh, man the library table on the Sunday convocations. And I ran across a book called QBL by sure. uh, uh, Frater Akkad. Uh, but even like, just, even just volunteering to sit at the table, you were, you were pretty seriously involved in this organization. Like you were the, you were one of those volunteer types. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so I read the Frater Akkad uh, QBL and uh, got interested in Kabbalah. But that's also where I first uh, saw the word Aleister Crowley or the name Aleister Crowley in a footnote. Whoa. So, so not from the picture on uh, the White Album or the, I'm sorry, Sgt. Pepper's. The, 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 like a lot of people say that was what kind of brought Crowley back into existence was the fact that he was that uh, John Lennon put him on on Sergeant Pepper's. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't. You weren't aware. Yeah, uh, although I looked into all of those uh, uh, people we like, uh, uh, Crowley particular di didn't stand out to me at the didn't time. Didn't jump at that point. Uh, 
And Sorry, then, for, for anyone who's thinking right now that I'm very stupid for saying the White Album had a picture of Aleister Crowley, since it's a, it's a white thing, I apologize for being dumb. But oh, sorry, just lie. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so you you're involved in Amory. The first time you saw Alistair Crowley was in in QBL that that uh, um, right. on the and, table. Uh, but I didn't think much of it, and uh, some so of my Amory uh, uh, brothers and sisters encouraged me to join the BOTA. You know, sure. The, yeah. The, uh, still, still active today. Lots of people. Uh, I talk to lots of people who come out of that. They're still doing I, lots of stuff. If they, if they still have their correspondence course, I would recommend that to anybody. Still, it's good correspondence course in tarot. Well, you, uh, you live you live in the area. Have you ever been to the to the the sort of the Boda compound? Because like it's kind of weird. Because like no one who works there actually knows anything about it. They're literally just employees. There are people who know about it who are you know elsewhere, but like the Actual, like, if you get involved in it, you're not going to be talking to anyone who knows anything. <laughs> they they uh, literally I mean, don't care. They call Proneos, uh, uh, the public events. Yes. For Proneos. Uh, uh, it was pretty old Hollywood. Talk about kind of Ed Woody. <laughs> sure. <laughs> With an organist. He's, he, he's referring to my lighting design here, if you're, if you're wondering what he means by Ed Woody. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, short, shortly after that, I found this. Yes. At the Pickwick Bookstore in uh, Costa Mesa, Foth Terra. That that giant deck that you're holding in your hands right now that that is like uh, that has got to be. I want to say that there's nothing that has quite that orientation at this point. I mean, there's there's a large version, but I don't I don't feel like it's quite. I don't feel like, I feel like that is special what you're holding right there very very yeah. much so. Yeah. If you want to know how special it is go to eBay. Sure. Well, I know because even the crappy one I have is worth like 200 bucks, so yours has got to be worth a lot more than that. <laughs> so, uh after initially being freaked out, uh, oh, I love the cards. Sure, okay. absolutely. They're beautiful, right? I mean, how could you not? I just love the car. And now, now we're probably talking uh, 1970. Or, uh, this is about the same time. We're talking about n maybe 1972, about the time my mm -hmm. son was born. Uh, we were pretty much through with uh, our recording, uh, Charlie D and Milo uh, uh, years. And I was going to. Uh, I was attending the Lee Strasberg Theatrical uh, Theater Film and really? Theater Institute. Uh, and uh, I was initially sort of freaked out at, at, uh, when I realized that this guy's name was attached to it. Because uh, I looked it up in my little occult dictionary that we wrote all those songs. Uh huh. <laughs> And it, and it said, Alistair Crowley, a famous Scottish Satanist. Right. And um, the, I, first, the, first, the first Crowley thing I ever saw said he was a famous black magician, which also alarmed me slightly, but I still read the book. Um, it, similar, similar. And I was, I was freaked out and, uh, uh, because I, I'm happy being a heretic, sure. but uh, the fantasies I had about what uh, Satanists were uh like you might meet jane mansfield i might or sammy davis jr or yeah. sammy davis jr yeah party with party <laughs> with the I, rat pack we worked with sammy davis jr charlie charlie and i uh played an infamous uh gig with him at the coconut grove well that sounds like a, a whole interview in itself oh, that's such a story <laughs> uh tell us just the 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 tidbit of it just like the, the one minute version well, because uh, we literally are, we're at we're at chapter one of five hundred chapters in this interview, so. <laughs> no, just. A <laughs> well, let's say. Uh, My wife doesn't want to talk about anything else but this. She's she's a big fan of that time period. So. <laughs> she's like, just remember, she cancel everything. We write original material. Mm -hmm. We're sort of a very loose acid 
cowboy sound. Okay, absolutely. You can find Lon's early music on the internet, by the way, if you want to. It's it's, it's out there. If you oh, yeah. it, the Charlie D and Milo search it, you can find what he what he's talking about right now. Okay, go ahead. And so Sammy Davis Jr. Okay, right. uh, but we had this in a very good. Uh, uh, contract and relationship with uh with columbia or epic records which is columbia mm, right, right yes uh, so uh they gave us an an agent okay uh and the agent was the william morris agency okay we were with the william morris agency <laughs> and uh uh, and, and we got, you know, uh, uh, some gigs because uh, our single, and then the, the the single went to number one in a few in a few areas, and we traveled. Sure, that's gonna family. that's gonna that's gonna get you some some interest, right? And we opened with Arlo Guthrie and um, whatever, but anyway, they must have assigned us the the lowest echelon william morris agent at the agency he must have had his desk under the <laughs> stairs somewhere. Yeah. and this guy was was so anxious to win his spurs at the agency and we were his client that you were the project that he was going for it and so he calls us uh, one day. We're smoking hash, and uh... <laughs> <laughs> so oh, wait, hold, on, hold on, just one second. I just want to. I want to. Did you want to succeed, or were you? <laughs> seems like you're. You're kind of like, oh, we had the worst agent. We were taking drugs all the time. Like, were you? Were you, did you have an agenda of becoming like the, bo no. the most you could be, or just? No, we, uh, how old were you at the? How old were you at this time? Uh, Twenty six. Okay. Our, son, our son was born. Uh, I was twenty-eight. I joined the OTO when I was twenty-eight. I guess. Okay. Uh, but anyway, no, uh, we uh, we had remarkable lack of ambition. <laughs> but, but that's that's, a, that's an honest, very honest statement. Uh, and that's why Charlie and and me uh, made pretty good partners because neither one of us. Uh, we're attached to a goal of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But my whole life's been like that. Sure. I, yeah. Uh, except that, I mean, like, except that it hasn't. I mean, you, you clearly, like, I mean, just everything you said indicates a sort of a charmed life in many ways. Like, a lot of people, a lot of people would kill to have had uh, one of the opportunities that you, you've mentioned at least three so far. And I know a bunch more after that so you know yeah. like you've, you've really kind of been you know guided in some way you know uh but you know when i'm guided to to where i really uh something really snaps and i know that this is where i am and what i should be doing you know i just put the pedal to the metal and and go full full sure. bore but uh i I've never really been attached to try to micromanage uh, the, the exact direction that that's going to take me. I kind of live from microsecond to microsecond doing the only thing that appears to be the only thing that's there for me to do. Well, and, and like I said, when, when we first started this, I mean, when you are speaking publicly, everybody's entranced and just really enjoying your energy and, and the things that you say. And when, and when people are interacting with you personally, everyone's just in, uh, entranced by how sort of personable and, and humble and just sort of there you are. I mean, it's a very, you have a very, uh, your, your essence is very healing to a lot of nonsense that goes on in both in the, the world and in uh, particularly in the occult world. You know, you're you're a very kind person who's who's just a, you know, a a, a, a nice person to interact with. I, I mean, and I'm sure many people who are who are watching this uh, will recognize what I'm saying. Like, I mean, you're, you know, when you sign a book, you don't just like 
sign a line, like, you like draw a picture and you write something special. And at least, I mean, I don't know if you've changed your attitude in the few, last few years, but I mean, that, you, you used to like, you know, you, you've been a person who just sort of engages with whoever you're with in a really kind way. And that's, and, and, and I, I, I mean, when I say you have a charmed life, I think that might be the charm right there. It's just that you're like a nice, you're a, you're a good person who, who just like gives a lot of their energy back to whoever they're with. Um, so you joined, the, I mean, the OTO kind of uh, restructured itself or re, re, rebirthed, and you were like part of that initial rebirth of that. Of the yeah, OTO. what I did was, and I'm trying to, maybe I can find it really fast here. Um, and those giant cards, like, like literally, no one, you can't get those cards. That's not something that exists anymore. Like Lawn's cards are. Yeah, let's see if I can find the. I've got a set of cards. I've got a set of large, uh, from the 1980s, a uh, large, large format um, soft tarot, but they, they don't look like that. That's, that's special. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I, they had that card. Mine had that card in it, but it's not that same size. It's not the same orientation at all. It's totally different. This deck had this card in it, mm -hmm. okay, and it had that address, that Dublin, California address. Now, I had no idea that the OTO at that time only had, as far as I know now, only had six living members. Is that, a, that's hand signed by Grady right there? Yeah. Was I took that... I took it to my I took it to my Minerval and had him sign it. <laughs> really, that's amazing. Okay, yeah. so so for for those of you who don't know, Grady McMurtry is a, a, a an interesting character who basically is responsible in in many ways for the sort of continuing existence of the OTO. And uh, clearly, obviously, Juan uh, got to have him sign one when <laughs> very few people would have realized how important that was. So that's that's amazing. Well, uh, I started I started writing that address with uh, what I thought was profound and mystical letters, sure. uh, and thinking that it was a big organization with uh, temples with golden doors and everything like that. Absolutely. Why, why wouldn't you? And, They've got those amazing cards, right? <laughs> How could they not have <laughs> cloud cities going on? And it took about two years of them at first ignoring my stupid letters and then uh, writing back and forth, uh, uh, which was an, their attempt to uh, make sure that I wasn't a mass murderer uh, or, or <laughs> some other kind of occult crazy. Are you sure or were they just smoking pot too and not, and not uh, paying attention? What, uh, th th say again? <laughs> are you sure that's what they were doing or were they just smoking pot too and not paying attention to your letters well i think they're they both uh both can be true well, at the same time it's not it's not mutually exclusive <laughs> right right so it, you got i had no idea that uh you know the oto had had nearly become nothing non-existent uh uh after coley's death uh and you're one of the first sort of initiates of the rebirth of it, yes? Right. And uh, it was even before it was uh, uh, legally reincorporated or incorporated sure. in, in California. And, and you are the sort of, you are the deputy grandmaster of Ordo Templar. Is, is that still true? The US, US deputy, yeah. Do you, do you ever think about having your own coup and, and taking over? No, <laughs> that's what, uh, uh, I, think I feel, I feel, I mean, like you are a little more famous than the, than the actual grandmaster. <laughs> uh, I think I'm doing the most I can do right uh, now doing what I'm doing. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that you're not doing a lot. No, I know, but I just, you know, yeah. Sometimes the, the crown can seem appealing. <laughs> that just sounds no, like not a, you. <laughs> just pinch, you know. <laughs> uh, no, uh, uh, really, uh, after, after Grady's death uh, in 1985, right. uh, there was a bit of uncertainty that, uh, over the direction that uh, it might take 
under uh, uh, various. Yes, there's there, there, there's actually like an eight hour or so recording that you can find on the internet, various places. I don't think anyone's supposed to have it, but it's out there somewhere, and I've listened to it. And and yes, there's a lot of sort of arguing <laughs> back and forth amongst amongst all, all of you guys that that we all look up to about what was going to happen at that point. Um, and and of course, uh, HP took over. So and as as far as far as I'm concerned, the best uh, the best alternative happened i mean uh, it yeah. has to be right because that's what happened otherwise it would be there would be something massively wrong yeah, with otherwise it. i don't think it'd be here right well i mean either that or it'd be a different thing but i mean like you right. have to assume, like whatever happened is the is the thing that happened right <laughs> you know it's like crying over spilled milk like what do you what, you know could have been somebody else mm -hmm. so i mean like the, it seems like the major contenders were you know bill and, and then and then jim and then I want to say maybe Heydrich. Is that is, are those were those the three that were being discussed? Basically, as the as most. Yeah. Uh, officially, all the all of the existing knights. Sure, could uh, be. Were were nominated, uh, and it had to be uh, hammered out. At, were you at that meeting that I'm talking about? That was uh, a. Yeah. was you were there. Okay. <laughs> uh, what a that's a, that's sorry a, for getting nerdy folks i know like 90 percent of you have no idea what i'm talking about but like i don't get to i don't get to like force lon to talk to you usually lon and i haven't talked in i think it's been like four or five years maybe even more like since, like we sat down at a pantheon a while ago and had a chat for a while but like i mean we, we haven't talked to each other in quite a while and and like at that at in those environments i don't feel comfortable saying hey tell me about like was hb your choice or <laughs> you know like <laughs> but but like you know i'm not gonna say that like uh, you know i'm not gonna ask that question because that's super rude um <laughs> but but anyway you know like I, the, even the whole subject wouldn't come up so so but you were at that meeting where that decision was made and uh um do you feel like that like that experience changed sort of the course of things for the organization and you feel like that was that was the right way for it to go yeah uh and what are we looking at 1985 i guess yeah i mean certainly yeah. and it was recorded on like obviously tape because you can it was a lot of in the background of that, of that recording so those are those are demons <laughs> I, don't, I mean, the, the fact that somebody had the prescience of like, let's record this, this is like pretty amazing. <laughs> was it, it, did you record it, Lon? Huh? <laughs> Are you the recorder of that, of that meeting or no? <laughs> no, no? Do you know who did? Uh, I think it was uh, uh, officially, we all knew it was being recorded, uh, uh, most of the meetings for the sake of minutes and things like that are always recorded. But you weren't expecting that to become something that was all over the internet, were you? No. Because <laughs> there wasn't an internet. <laughs> like, who would have thought that literally people listening to this right now, 18 year old kids listening to this right now are gonna be out there finding this, this tape that you were sitting there in a room in the mid eighties. I was like a kid. My wife was like two years old. Uh, <laughs> but that's out there on this decision and these people are super excited about listening to it. it's like I, literally, I listen to it it's like it's so long and i listen to every second of it it was fascinated jim eshelman's like oh you guys should have me and you know like he seems pretty charming in some ways and <laughs> bill reese is like oh, you should have me and he seems like a really smart in some ways it's a fascinating like if you're into oto Oh, I mean, it's yeah. technically probably illegal and stuff to even have heard it, but I have. Sorry, you know. Like, um, it's so it's it pop, popcorn. It's a it's a binge listen. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Let's go. tell me more. <laughs> so okay, so uh, <laughs> so you get involved in, in 1978 in, in, in OTO. Uh, you, but like, I mean, honestly, you're probably one of the more well-known within, in at least the like kind of slice of uh, a culture that you and I are a part of. Uh, you, your first book was it? Was it the Enochian Vision Magic, the the um, the uh, New Falcon book, or was it something else? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I never 
planned on writing. Writing's hard. Sure. I hate it. I mean, I don't hate it. I I do it now, but I never thought about writing because uh, it's work, and I I spend my life trying to avoid work. Sure. As a yeah. musician and an, and an artist, I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Much yeah. more fun to just like daydream and do your whatever. Uh, but uh, uh, really, I, I have to uh, give complete credit to uh, uh, Christopher Hyatt, who is Dr. Alan Miller. Uh, May he rest for, in peace. For uh, uh, We initiated him uh, into the OTO at our lodge here in Costa Mesa. <clears throat> so, so you you did you initiate uh christopher Hyatt? yeah interesting okay uh so he was one of our lodge members and uh 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 one of the most famous lodge members that we that we had because he already had his uh uh his uh book undoing yourself which was already a uh sort of a best-selling I did not. So you're saying undoing yourself preceded his involvement in OTO and your relationship with him. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, uh, so he had that publishing company, uh, uh, New Falcon. And uh, I was, uh, we're talking about 1988 by now. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, experiencing one of my uh, uh, frequent and lengthy periods of unemployment. <laughs> and uh, I thought I would use the, uh, the time to, uh, uh, you know, formally do the, the Liber Samic invocation of the Holy Guardian Angel sure. uh, series. And so I was doing that uh, in the in the mornings and the afternoons and and uh, uh, I was really getting into that and uh, the the phone rings uh, one of the mid mornings and uh, it's uh, Alan or Christopher Hyatt uh, asking me if I wanted to help him uh, write a book uh, that he wanted to call the ultimate divination. Uh, but it, it uses tarot cards as part of the ultimate divination. Okay. And he didn't feel his uh, grasp of the tarot vis-a-vis -vis Kabbalah was uh, uh, strong enough. And, and uh, if I wanted to, uh, he would uh, uh, pay me uh, $1,200 a month and give me half the royalties. Wait, wait. Twelve hundred dollars a month. This is nineteen. What? What does this happen? Eighty-eight. So I mean, twelve hundred dollars a month. Like that's a pretty good. That's a. That's an okay amount of money, even today. Like what? That's what sounds. Yeah. Like, did he really give you that amount of money? Yeah, because uh, he wanted to write me a six hundred and sixty-six dollar check every two weeks. <laughs> okay, I got it. <laughs> and you know that was an offer I couldn't refuse. Sure. Why? Well, I, I mean, yeah. And uh, so I drove up to his uh, home about 25 miles away uh, up the coast highway to Long Beach uh, every morning or, or five days a week. And uh, he more or less taught me the discipline of, of writing. And uh, he'd, uh, he had a beautiful apartment uh, up on the 11th floor of overlooking the bay and everything. It was very... Uh, <laughs> it was very luxurious and very cool. And, and, uh, and how, how had Hyatt accomplished that at that point? Just from, from his writing or from something else? Uh, oh, something else. Yeah. Yeah. Investments and... Sure. Whatever. Not writing. That's a, uh, the important thing I want people to realize is that there's not that much money in occult writing, so don't like feel like there's you're going to no become money. a rich person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, so we started and nearly finished that uh, uh, that book, and one afternoon uh, over martinis at four o'clock, we'd have martinis. Uh, we started talking about Enochian magic. And uh, he, uh, 
he was saying how hard he, complex and hard he thought it was. And, uh, and uh, I said, no, it's, it's not hard. It's so, it's so easy that to talk about it sounds hard. Because yeah. you had read the Equinox and you'd seen oh, the, yeah. the Crowley's, uh, the simplification of it in many ways. Or, or, and uh, I said, the reason that Crowley sounds so, uh, so hard is that he's, uh, he, uh, he's telling us so much in so few words. Right. And, Which uh, is often true of Alistair Crowley. Yeah. Like he really, he's a dense writer in a lot of ways. Yeah. You, know, you gotta, you gotta read it three times. So we stopped, we stopped that project and the tarot the uh, the ultimate divination yeah. project let's write this enochian book and he said write it uh an extended commentary on libra Hanok. and and then he said uh you know i'll write a little sex magic uh uh yes and he did uh, introduction to it and, and uh, uh, can, I, I need to interrupt you i keep interrupting you. i'm sorry but i just want to mention as a fanboy that is literally my favorite enochian book <laughs> and I have a lot of them. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a whole like two yeah, shelves I, full of them. But, and, that, and your little book is the best, in my opinion. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Wiser's. Let's see. Is this the one? Yeah, that's what it looks like now. Sort of. Oh wow, wow. So okay, but this is an interesting area. I don't. I don't think we have time to talk about this today. Hopefully, uh, we can do this again another time. Uh, but. Uh, the the state of occult publishing, particularly the Falcon publishing, I, I want to get. I would love to talk to you more about this because it's, it's fascinating to me. But I want to I want to talk to you. About, okay, so you wrote this book on Enochian, and you you teach a class on Enochian. I don't know if you're still doing it, but like when 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 I was living in California, you were teaching a weekly class on Enochian magic in your house. People, whatever. OTO members or OTO friendly people were coming over every week and you were doing visions with them and teaching them in OK Magic. Are, are you still doing that or no? Uh, well, we have, we've stopped Monday night class after 40 That's Monday night, yeah. Uh, because of COVID or, or before that? Just, no, just because of the, the pandemic. So hopefully when the pandemic is... Uh, behind us we'll we'll start that up again i mean that's that's that in it in and of itself is so emblematic of what a nice person you are <laughs> that you that you literally like have opened your home and opened yourself to teaching this stuff every monday night for i mean the first time i was aware of it was 2002 i think when i was living out in california when i came to visit you in your house and and I um, mean, you know, so that's 18 years. And I want to say it was solidly a tradition a long, long time before that. So, so I mean, you've been doing this for so long. Since 1979. Um, I mean, wow. I mean, wow. I mean, if you are, if you are like on the fence, like is Lon the best person in the world or not? Like, I mean, think about that. This is a guy who's opened his home for 30 years to people coming over on Monday night to have an Anukian scrying session with him. But, uh, I mean, yeah, I guess 40, yeah, yeah. Um, no, 30, well, 80, 90, yeah, yeah. Uh, four, almost, four, almost 40 at this point, yeah. With the, with the pandemic, it would be over 40, right? So anyway, amazing, amazing. So uh, I, you know, like I, like, I, how do you, leaving writing aside, you know, I mean, obviously you've, you've accomplished a lot in terms of writing uh, memoirs of your experiences and so forth. Like you're, you're, like I'm trying to ask the things that are in between the cracks of your, of your, because I've read your books on your life. And I'm trying to like, you know, go, go in between there a little bit for people who are interested in that. Um, but how have you managed to be so, like you, you and I, I feel like we're kindred spirits in the fact that we don't really want to like, you know, we want to have like a nice life, have <laughs> fun. But you, but you are so dedicated to having uh, various things happen constantly. Like you, you do a right now. You're doing a, a daily um, live video every day. How how long is that video usually? I don't know. Did I start in in April or? March? I don't know. I mean, but, but I mean, you've been doing it every single day, every day. right? Yeah. And and how long do you broadcast for usually? 
Uh, it's usually between 20 minutes and 35 minutes. So, I mean, I mean, you're sitting there <laughs> sharing yourself for a significant portion of the day, every day, every single day. And, you know, before that you were doing every, like what, what, what motivates you to do that? Uh, well, it's keeping me sane, actually. Uh, first of all, the, can you imagine the momentum that came to a screeching halt when we had to uh, uh, put a pause on Monday Night Magic Class. Sure, absolutely. Now, Monday Night Magic Class is a, is a, is a different thing. because uh, you, You've been to them, so, so sure, yeah. uh, you know that uh, I just don't sit there and, and lead a class and lecture and stuff. The, the, the class has a dynamic of its own that mm -hmm. I don't... Uh, I actually don't teach a class. I just sort of write it like a mo mechanical bull, you know. Well, I mean, that's that's the modest way of of expressing yourself, but yeah, ultimately, yeah. You're, you're, yeah. you're you're you you know you're doing a lot. Okay, I get it. What you're saying, but uh, uh, over the years, I have written, you know, a lot of books, and uh, uh, I've almost forgotten what I've written in. In, in some of them, and when I read them over again, I go, "Shit, uh, boy, was I smart back then!" You know, I sure. I, I couldn't write this today. You know, the, and uh, so I thought, well, why not? I, I enjoy reading them again. Why don't I read them out out loud? <laughs> <clears throat> and over the years, back when you, so you can let people know back when you were smart. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Back when you back when you knew what you were talking about, you're sharing that information. And I'm learning. I'm learning from my relearning, right? Remembering what that genius had to say. <laughs> but uh, uh, so the uh, in, in a way, I I have to uh, Monday night class. We had to clean up the house. Constance. Uh, had to dust the top of the refrigerator every Monday, you know, and uh, the vacuum and clean the floors. And, and uh, uh, we were forced from uh, Monday night class, forced us to be uh, civilized. <laughs> sure. Although I, I, it sounds a little like you're saying Constance might have OCD. And that wasn't my impression from meeting her, but. <laughs> does she did, does she have OCD? <laughs> but, well, she's but, very tidy. Okay. She's very she oh she wants people to understand that she's tidy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I get that. That's a, my my wife is exactly the same. Way. She doesn't want people to know how messy it is when a, when they aren't around. You know, and I'm a to... slob. I'm a, I'm a total <laughs> slob. But anyway, so I sort of need to uh, get presentable. Sure. Every day, even if it's for 15 minutes. And uh, I, I, uh, uh, I'm lucky enough to have been on Facebook long enough uh, to have 5,000 very uh, uh, engaged uh, yes. Facebook friends. And uh, uh, it's very it's very helpful, and uh, even though uh, making or writing occult books is not a get rich quick scheme at all, it is absolutely not. And if you are thinking that, you need to put that out of your head because it's literally not going to happen, honestly. And if you're going to if you're going to make money writing, uh, write something very commercial and yes. and. <laughs> Lots of boobs, lots of sex, lots of mystery. Yeah, that's your, that's yeah. your better angle. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, uh, you can make a little, a, a little more uh, dent in your uh, yearly rent uh, by lecturing and stuff. And I've been uh, uh, lucky that I'm a good traveler, and uh, I enjoy travel. And for about the last 10 years, uh, part of me keeping a roof over our head here in our little rental duplex here uh, has been me going off to China or going off to uh, uh, 
uh, Europe and and being gone for a month or so and and lecturing and just staying in hotels and saving my money. Sure, and but I mean, like realistically, the truth is that you are a very dynamic speaker and a very like I mean, per, uh, people, you know, I, I I've been at events, many events where you're speaking where, you know, you really do make people feel really nice and that's and that's something about who you are as a person so uh, you know like that's not just because you've written a bunch of cult of occult books like you, you know like you you have a you have a nice uh, a nice manner of presentation like uh, what what i've really admired about you is that you you manage to be both knowledgeable scholarly and also very funny like you really you i in and, and it, if you lean in one direction or another, it's actually funny, right? <laughs> you know, like that's 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 where that's where your lean in is 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 to amuse people and to make people feel good and to have have a fun time. So like, well, you got it. it it's all pretty funny. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, that's very true. But I but I, I'm going to tell you right now, there are a lot of people who are interested in the occult to have, find a way of making it not that funny. So <laughs> you know, like you, yeah. you 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 have definitely. I mean, like. And and the 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 particular the 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 flavor of occultism that you are involved in that I that I you know is like sort of my source material of my life is I mean Crowley is actually a very funny person in in many ways but I mean like you make it you know like actually funny. <laughs> like you make people laugh whereas Crowley you're like oh that's clever that he thought that but you're but you actually are you know pretty like well, the, what. <laughs> I don't mean to kiss your ass, but like one of my favorite things is like when when you, and I and I heard you say it several times at different events. You, you used to be like, um, I've got a table at the back, and I have no plan for <laughs> my 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 family's future. So I hope that you're going to plan on buying something for me. Like, <laughs> like I'm I'm not saying it quite as as amusingly as you said, it, but that's but that's well, that's, it's uh, true. So. <laughs> No, but that's what makes things funny is when you I mean honesty is the funniest thing, right? <laughs> I've made no further provision. Right. No, yes, it. I've made no further provisions for my family. So I'm hoping that you're gonna buy some books from me in the back of the room. <laughs> that is I mean, that is like a, a very charming thing to say. So uh, I I a bit, I'm I I'm I know that you probably have other things to do besides chatting with me for the end of your uh, your life, but um, I just want to ask you a couple, a little bit more, like sort of practical, magical questions, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, let you go. <laughs> um, I, and my wife was like, I, she literally wants to hear me talk to you for t until the end of time. She's like over there, literally. She's, she's our biggest fan. The, 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 the <laughs> Jason N and Milo show. <laughs> she's, she's our, she's our, 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 our biggest fan girl. But, um, so. Uh, where where do you stand on? I mean, like you know, because the life of a of a thalamic magician it, it, it can take many different directions. And and do do you still practice a sort of practical magic or or ritual magic in any way, or or have you moved sort of more into just sort of a, a lifestyle of magic? Well, it's free form now, uh, uh, but it's only it's only free form now. Uh, because over the last 50 years, uh, there were different levels of it being very unfree form. Um, Which you've accounted for in many of your writings. I mean, like you, right. well, you, you've got a lot of, a lot of, again, very entertaining, wonderful, um, you know, memoir writings that you've, that you've shared, which are just, you know, wonderful, that they give so much to the community. But um, so where are you, where are you now? I think the important thing to, to remember is that uh, the structured magical disciplines that you would do, say, in the first 20 years of, of your magical practice uh, is really preparatory to everything that you'll end up doing before all of this is actually integrated in you. Uh, for, for many years, it's actually important for you to, to have an almond wand, <laughs> okay, and oil it up with your oil of abramelin and keep it in its, in its nice little 
thing. And when you do your your uh, uh, daily uh, uh, banishings and invocations uh, prior to your uh, pranayama and, and your mantra yoga, your your meditations. Uh, uh, it, it's very important that uh, that you do that, and when you when you feel the need that that uh, you sh should start, uh, uh, or you feel the need to evoke a Goetic spirit or something like that, it's really helpful for you to to uh, go to the trouble of, uh, of of casting your your circle and and. Uh, choosing your your divine names and names of protection and and uh, constructing the uh, your circle and triangle and and everything and to and to do it if your sense of art uh, dictates uh, to do it directly out of the out of the lesser key of Solomon then do it just like just like that okay. But there comes there comes a time, and you're doing all of this uh, uh, at least during the, the the first part of your magical career. You're doing it in a sense as a, uh, almost as an experiment. Sure. Uh, to uh, because you're not sure what the reaction is is going to be. Actually, you're not even sure if it's your will. That you be doing do that, yeah, sure. These things, and uh, uh, if you're lucky, the things that blow up in your face don't blow up so badly that your your, right. your life is irreparably ruined. And you might be lucky to to uh, to uh, uh, realize, well, I had a, I uh, you know, I lucked out there. I had a really good feeling about that, and it really has worked out. And somewhere along the line, something happens to you, uh, and it happens to everybody in a different way, but it eventually happens, either this life or another. Okay. <laughs> it eventually happens when you uh, wake up one morning and have realized that all of this has been integrated and you've fulfilled all of the textbook prerequisites of what has always been called the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel. And you finally put it in perspective how that has just happened to you maybe three years ago. Sure. There's a, there's a movement right now though that is, that is kind of dismissive of the I mean, of, of Crowley a, a, a lot, but but it, it more, even more so, kind of the the whole way that that you and I would probably define magic. That you know, the Golden Dawn and and the and the you know, Aleister Crowley and, and even Wicca, and and they want to go back to the the Grimoireic movements and so forth. What, what what do you think of all that? Uh, magic is an art, and if and if that is the art form that is inspiring you and energizing your your magical work, your personal magical work, then I'm all for that. It seems like a number of the people who who I know who are who are into that have either been a part of OTO or they are presently a part of OTO, and yet they are actually like putting more much more of their energy into that sort of grimoire magic stuff do you feel like that's like a natural evolution or you know what what what, what what's your perspective on that well it can be for, uh, for each individual the you, you know we're not doing any of this stuff to crystallize to crystallize ourselves we're doing this to grow sure and uh so the th same things that we, that we did uh uh 50 years ago will be totally useless to us to us now but we wouldn't be who we are today had we not done that 50 years ago so it, it's hard for us to uh it's hard for us to say and it's different for absolutely everybody but uh once that holy guardian angel or that five six uh 
uh, awakening has, has uh, sunk in, you, you realize that you've integrated all your, all your tools. So I don't, uh, when I travel, I travel with a full magical uh, temple with me. Of course, the temple's in my brain. <laughs> the temple is in me. But my deck of tarot cards is, is my magical circle. If, if I feel the necessary. Who did the art on that, on that, uh, that deck? Uh, I did the line drawings and Constance did the coloring. So, uh, for is that for still for sale, or is that is that? Right. Oh yeah, that's the new edition. Oh, it just came out again. Yeah. So I mean, Lon designed a deck of uh, ceremonial magic um, tarot cards that is um, really, it's very cool. Like I mean, it's it, yeah, <laughs> it's it in many ways is it it kind of evolves from the the Thoth tarot, but but it kind of goes even more into the into the symbolical. Um, things that are in 777 and so forth. It's got, it's got a lot of, I mean, like, it's, it's a, like, if you're interested in the Kabbalistic significance of, and, yeah, and Enochian significance, like, so, so what he's showing on the screen right now, he's got, he's got the, um, the, the square of the, of the uh, Enochian tablet of, uh, what, of, of, of the West, uh, there that the the prince of uh, the the king of cups or the knight of cups would be involved with, and then he's got the Tatra card that goes on it, and the and the and the the bit of the um the the Enochian tablet that would and and, and, and in the left hand corner you got the I Ching square. I mean, it's like it's like a it, in many ways it's a sort of a Rosetta stone for the the way in which um the, the uh, occult symbolism fits with within the, the tarot. Um, and, and much more explicit than I think almost any other deck in many ways. I mean, it's got the the, the only thing like if you're super not interested in Thelema, you might find some aspects of it a little bit, you know, not your cup of tea. But but really, it not even that you can just like get past that and just look at all the. I mean, the symbols are are there. You know, it's got all the spirits of the Goetia and all the spirits of the of the Hem, Hemfresh that are that are connected with like like it's it's a really cool kind of like uh, uh, crib sheet for for how to connect all the all the the different symbols of of of, of the Western mystery system all to all within the tarot. It's a very cool deck. I I, I like it a lot. It's a nice portable temple. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Think... Uh, I'll take the 36 small cards and just ordering them in, in uh, astrological decant order is ordering the, yeah. the circle in your brain. Absolutely. And I'll just lay them out on the floor of the hotel room and sit in the middle of it. And that's, that's my magical circle. And uh, 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 if I need to evoke or feel I need to evoke a, a spirit of the Goetia, they're all included on the 36 small cards. That's actually and, something I was going to ask you. Like at this point in your life, you know, you're, you, you've been practicing magic since before 99% of the people who consider themselves the masters of magic at this point, you know, you, you, you've got like 30 years on most of those people. I've got 20 on most of them. <laughs> um, you actually, you've got 40. I, I would say you've got 40 at least. Um, wh what, what would make you evoke a, a spirit or, you know, like what, what is, what is the, what is the impetus for continuing forward with magic for you on a practical level? An emergency. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, your, 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 uh, your books have, have some stories about those sorts of things, but like, <laughs> what, what sort of emergency would, would that, would, would cause something like that? The, uh, the, first of all, uh, something like a Goetia evocation, uh, is, uh, uh, something that, that's few and far between at this, at this stage, but it's not completely, uh, out of the question. And there's been, there's been times, uh, when surprise events have, uh, 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 popped up, especially if I'm out of the country or, uh, sure. you know, uh, where strange things are happening. 
Do you have particular um, spirits that you like to work with? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a, uh, just a very, very small menagerie. That are the ones that you, that you, feel, that you feel close to? Or? Well, the, the, the thing is, once, uh, uh, like everything in, in magic, uh, what you've had success with, you have acquaintance with. Sure. And, and uh, you resonate to. And there, there, there are uh, two or three uh, uh, spirits in particular that have uh, incredibly good track record at certain at certain things, and uh, uh, so, but that's an ongoing relationship. The same relationship that you would have with, uh, uh, like uh, you and me, we've known each other for many years. Well, and then you know, and in a sense, on a magical level, we can count on each other. Sure. For, uh, yeah, I mean, if you asked me to do something for you, I would absolutely do it if yeah. it was within my power. And we could more or less count on each other's, you know, competence to uh, to do what we we could. I mean, uh, particularly with me, a very small area of competence, but yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so uh, my wife is getting upset with me being humble. So uh, I'm, I'm sure if Constance was in the room, she'd be like, yeah. You're too humble. Okay, so, so you're, um, the, where do you see spirits as existing? Because this is, this is, an, this is a situation that like the, the magical community is going through this thing right now where there's like a lot of people who, you know, who see them as being sort of a psychological phenomenon or something that's in the deep structure of consciousness. And then there's folks who feel like it's something that is inherent, you know, inherent within God's creation. And, and, you know, you need, you need to just simply tap it. Like, where do you, where do you fall on that sort of? Well, uh, I guess it would depend on uh, how separated you feel from the singularity. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Cause that's where I'm, where, where I feel. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you uh, uh, if your present consciousness of identity is uh, 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 still uh, centered in uh, uh, a this or that subject predicate observer observee uh, duality then uh, uh, the more you're invested or the more your consciousness is clouded in duality, uh, the more objective of a reality the, the spirits take for you. Okay. Uh, not that they're not real as objective things, but uh, your uh, uh, consciousness of the intensity of that reality depends on how invested you are in your own sense of separateness. Sure. So the, the spirit, instead of arguing objectiveness or subjectiveness of, uh, of the spirits and if hell's a real place or heaven's a real place or the seven levels of the uh, Kabbalistic uh, heavens are, are real places or spirits or objective things. The answer to all of that is yes, yes, they, they sure. are. Because uh, you can talk about it, so it has to be. <laughs> like it exists because someone can, yeah. someone can say it, you know, like you But ult ultimately, uh, uh, you can even start to approach uh, the concept of of their ultimate reality by uh, by seeing them as uh, uh, aspects or frequencies of consciousness that that uh, temporarily and by your own uh, needs and necessity take take uh, form and personality. So uh, in the cold light of, of reason, 
you could say they're all metaphors. Okay. But we don't live in the cold light of reason. We li no. <laughs> we live in a metaphor. Okay. Sure. Everything's so, a metaphor, right? Part of the beauty of the art of magic is that we we uh, we direct a chorus of metaphors for our own edification, for our own evolution, for our own uh, hopefully for our own evolution. And and the uh, the biggest danger in ma in magic is that we get sidetracked and we conduct our metaphors for entertainment i've noticed that the, see, to me it seems like there's three types of people who are interested in magic and and those are people who are interested in sort of uh feeling states and experiences and they they don't really want to read about stuff they just want to experience things they want to dance around the fire and have that experience and then there's another group of people who are interested in um sort of understanding the history of where things came from and they want to know the the you know the the story of where you know like what was the first version of this manuscript and, and where does it go and they, and they and they and the those two people those two groups like the the feelers tend to do a lot of sort of ritual in one way or another they want to they want to experience it and the the thinkers tend to not do all that much ritual because they want to understand the correct way to do it before they get started. And there's a third category of people who want to sort of like grow as a, as a, as a being to a higher state. And for them, both of those categories may be a, a pathway in, but they want to, they want to move to a higher state. And I, I don't know if there's a correct or, or um, that, you know, which one of those people is, is the right way to approach magic, but where do you, where do you feel like you fall in that? Uh, they're all needed and they're all necessary. Uh, I am such a lazy person and I'm such a lazy scholar that I thank the gods for the thinking. Kind the people of. Who, who like to really look into the deep stuff. Oh my god, yes. Uh, I, uh, my library is filled with their work. And They're I very just, smart works, right? Yeah, and me I too. Just, <laughs> I just, I'm so grateful for them. I'm so grateful for them. Uh, and and uh, I don't pass judgment or even I'm tempted to pass judgment over whether their armchair uh, expertise is, is bringing them any personal uh, uh, spiritual growth or enlightenment. I just thank God that they're there for me. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm not judging those three categories. I'm just yeah. saying that those seem to be the three like, sort of like the easiest way to break up the community. <laughs> you know, the, the three sort of like that that's who they are. I have to think that because ultimately I'm not separated from you or it, or them or, or anybody else. Sure. That that uh, their work and their their and the effects of their work on my consciousness uh, isn't also part of their great of their great work because absolutely ultimately, ultimately there's only one great work and there's only one great worker and uh, so uh, uh, but it's kind of interesting uh, and it also uh, you know helps me not get involved in big discussions on the internet about. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. About things, you know, because I, 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 it's not that I think, oh, I'm above that, because I'm certainly not above that. It's yeah. just, um, me either. Um, I, I feel like I, I mean, like this, that, that an absolutist attitude towards anything is gonna, just gonna, you know, you, you, that's not gonna be representative of who you are to begin with, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna help you to interact with anyone <laughs> on any level. Yeah. You know? So. Uh, but one one thing that's interesting is your your Enochian vision magic book, the the first Law and Mile Educate book that I was aware of, and I think maybe was the first book that you wrote. Yes, is that correct? The, oh, the, oh, oh uh, with Hayek. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Enochian world of Alistair Crowley or something. Like Enochian that. sex magic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. So it, that book was very influential on me in a very practical way uh, for a number of very practical reasons and and. and uh, things that 
a lot of people today, it, I mean, that was written in what, ni 1994? Is that? Uh, 90. 1990, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I didn't encounter it until probably 1996. But a uh, wonderful book. And one of the best things about it is that basically you say, like, if you don't have the stuff that you need to do this, just like, find a different way of making that stuff work <laughs> you know, like, you're like you're very you're very like hey, you photocopy this stuff from this book and just you know like make make it happen and then just continue forward with doing the rituals and explore it from a perspective of, of like practically looking into this stuff which is 100 percent my attitude and, and and very much influenced by that book and by you um because i feel like if you if you're putting your energy into it, you're going to get some results from just doing it, putting your energy into it. Now, uh, a, uh, a decade or so later, you wrote Enochian Vision Magic, which is a, it's a wiser book. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a much bigger book <laughs> and it has a lot of other stuff in it that has nothing to do with the stuff. Like what, what happened during that intervening decade and a half that, that, that made that, made you feel like you needed to write that book? Well, the, the 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 first book was uh, sort of taking the what the Golden Dawn, that part of the Enochian system that the Golden Dawn uh, utilized. They sort of cherry picked. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. The elemental. Or, or only were aware of. <laughs> yeah. Like who knows? Like. But there's there's enough cherries there to just sure. keep Lots of cherries. Forever, you know. Uh, but it's, uh, and it's, and it's how most people, you know, s start off with the Enochian thing to, mm -hmm. uh, okay, I can wrap, finally, I can wrap my brain around what these elemental tablets are about. What this is, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, uh, uh to me, the most helpful part of that whole book was the step-by-step -step coloring process that, uh. Listen, uh, everything is helpful about that book. It's honestly... The most practical book you'll ever find on Enochian magic, and you know, I mean, but it, it's Golden Dawn style. So if you want to do the like right. the purest version, you're not going to get anything out of it. But like, so but, and it works. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. As a vision magic, uh, Enochian magic. That's what I call Enochian magic right out of the box. Yeah, that's, absolutely. It's right out of the Golden Dawn box. Uh, you can you can do it the same day you buy that book. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. It's it's one hundred percent like you can you can get started. You got if you if you got a Xerox machine and you want to you know make some equipment, you're there. If you want to just skip that stuff, Lon gives you permission to do it. What's interesting about it is like that that book inspired a lot of uh, practical work that I did with a group of people, which I think you've done similar work with other people. And a lot of a lot of visionary work people, and 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 I teach a class now where it's basically based on what you taught, and then what I realized later, which is that when you're when you're speaking about stuff to other people, when you when you're when you're closing your eyes and having a vision of stuff, you're gonna have more visions when you're talking about it to the people who are around you than if you're just sitting by yourself. Like you'll, you, yes. you're, yeah. you're not gonna have a lot of visions at that point. And so I realized. That speaking about it like like literally just connecting with the the visionary connecting the the part of your brain that that uh ha experiences visions and the part of your brain that puts things out in language changes your whole experience of things in this incredibly dynamic way um and it was your work that really is responsible for that so anyone who takes my experiencing visionary magic class Lon's book on experience uh, on uh, you know the Enochian uh, no, sorry the say the title again? Enochian world of Aleister Crowley. I mean, like super. You, you could only have that title in a person in a in a, a publishing company that was not really that interested in. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's like it's got a it's got the longest title that you could ever have, and but it, it's a great it's a it's a little book and. Uh, uh, is it is it in print at this point or yes? Yes, yeah. uh, that's that's the newest. Wiser took it. Wiser grabbed it. No, this is uh, New Falcon Publications. Who's who's who is New Falcon now? Uh, there's there's original Falcon. Right. Okay. Uh, which is the new Falcon? <laughs> no, when when Hyatt died. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
Falcon broke up and did two things. Uh, his, uh, uh, his, his wife has uh, what is now uh, original Falcon. Mm -hmm. And uh, his son has uh, new Falcon. Okay. So, okay. so there's two publishing companies with but the, Do they own, do they both own the rights to everybody's work or? They both have them get either one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> which one's better though, honestly? If you're like, which one's the better? I, I you're, not gonna make, you're not gonna make it that visit. <laughs> yeah. this it, has there ever been a situation in publishing in the history of publishing where there's two people who literally just like, we're both gonna own the copyright to this? <laughs> Well, we've we. They both uh, send you your checks, or or like how's that work? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So no, like no, no harm, no foul. You're you're into both. One is called uh, uh, Anoki, I think it's still called Enochian Sex Magic. Yes. Uh, Which is a. The one is if called. You're, if you're looking for that information, this is not the great source for that. <laughs> but like, it's a great book. I mean, I get it. But if it's if you're wanting information about Enochian sex magic, but, uh, but the purely Enochian stuff, uh, fantastic, is in. Oh, excuse me. I gotta turn that off. The purely Enochian stuff is. Is HB getting mad that you're talking to me? Huh? <laughs> I, said, is, I said, is HB getting mad that you're talking to me? No. I, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Let's see. I got it. There we go. Um, but anyway, you're asking about the difference between that and Enochian vision magic. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that's like, I mean, that like, the, the, just a brief, like, uh, to give a preface to this, your book. Uh, the, that one that you just showed, it, it's really just Alistair Crowley's uh, work that you, have, that you have given the actual way to make that practical, which is what is amazing about it. Like literally, if you, if you look at, the, if you look at the, 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 what is published in the Equinox from you know, 1909 or whatever, it's, it's yeah. like, it, it doesn't make any sense. Like you're not gonna be able to do anything with it. Lon has made that something that you can actually just Get your friends together and do do it. You're going to be able to do it. But Enoki and Vision Magic, where, what, what's that? Well, after about 20 years of uh, of uh, on and off doing uh, uh, introductory Enochian classes at Monday Night Magic class, uh, uh, the next time Enochian was going to be the subject. I started to think th that uh, Enochian magic right out of the box works great, okay? Uh, but that's not, it's not what Dee and Kelly did. Sure. Uh, what Dee and Kelly did was almost three years of magic that prepared them to receive the, in, the information uh, uh, that would later become what the Golden Dawn, Dawn would use. So Absolutely. in other words, uh, Dean Kelly spent three years getting the, the design and the blueprint and all of the engineering for a Ferrari, and then, then they never drove the Ferrari. As far as we know. Right. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, uh, you know. So I came to the strange little confu uh, conclusion, confusion. <laughs> Both fit, right? <laughs> for, for those, uh, during those three, almost three years, the, the idea of the holy table and the Sigillum de Ameth and a whole bunch of other things received by Dee and Kelly from their angelic contacts. And it was only after uh, years of this tedious angelic communication and squares and sure. magic squares and uh, uh, alphanumeric squares and cryptograms and things that Dee and Kelly were actually being reprogrammed 
their 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 mental and psychic machinery was being retooled by this experience of creating the holy table, the siglum de meth, and and uh, the ring, right. the lamin, and and all of the things that the angels were telling Dee and Kelly were very important to the system before they got this last creme de la creme thing, the calls, uh, the, the keys, the connection yep. to, the, to the great table. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna get out the original material, the original D and Kelly material and look at it and see how it was that they might have gotten themselves programmed to do Enochian magic. Mm -hmm. And with the idea of being, if we can figure out a way to, in a very concentrated, condensed way, reproduce that experience, if the magician, the modern magician, could also experience and prepare himself or herself the same way Dee and Kelly were prepared uh, uh, to do it, how much more intense might your scrying experience be if you went through Dee, what Dee and Kelly experienced and then did your Enochian magic right out of the box? So that's what that book is about. Do you, do you feel like that has been significantly different than, than the earlier version or...? It's the difference between black and white in color. So, I mean, like, I, I feel like Lana Mala Duquette, probably not like a devout Christian, but John D and Edward Kelly, yeah, super crazy devout Christians. Like, where, where, do, you, where do you fit within that, within that, uh, that paradigm? Uh, I think if every Christian was like, uh, like John D. <laughs> I mean, it would be different. You're right. It would be different. But, <laughs> that, is, would be in the but like, that, that, yeah. that might have a little bit to do with IQ, too. I mean, like, uh, right, you know, than just the... <laughs> yes, we both, we both get silent over that, over that concept, <laughs> which is super uh, yeah, transparently yeah. obvious, right? <laughs> it's, it's a very little adjustment for us to... Uh, uh, adjust our perception of uh, uh, their perception mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, how information comes sure. through. Uh, it, it, it's like they were, it's the same air that's being blown through a Christian trumpet or, <laughs> or, a, or a modern agnostic trumpet. Sure. It's the same Absolutely. air, the same note, okay. Uh, but... Yeah. They, I mean, the conclusions that they come to are are fairly different. You know, I mean, the the oh yeah, I mean, especially the uh, the uh, Logogoth period. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's just that's literally just a period of of a bunch of stuff that we still don't know what they're talking that's about. Just apocalyptic uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, craziness, and yeah. we got we got to also remember that uh, that even though Kelly. Uh, and D had great chemistry uh, as far as uh, uh, being. I'm going to say like like Lon Milo and Jason. Oh, <laughs> oh no! My, my, my wife is objecting to this concept, so obviously I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> they had great chemistry, but but uh, not uh, necessarily the same way. I get it. <laughs> you guys are so mean. I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to stop <laughs> talking. I was totally I kidding. Uh, Kelly was still uh, was still unstable and uh, yes. and uh, uh, eas easily freaked out. Absolutely. <laughs> and I mean, so a bit hidden because uh, dismissed uh, everything over yeah. and over again, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's it. It helps to have a good idea of the character of uh, 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 the people involved. In the same way, it's a good idea to keep in mind Crowley's character. Uh, Absolutely. And so, and so, like, uh, okay. So here's uh, before we stop this. I uh, eventually I'm gonna have to let you go. No, I like talking. Right. I literally could talk to you for the rest of 
the my 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 wife life. literally doesn't want us to stop ever uh, for the for our whole existence to the, to the to the end of the universe. And hopefully we'll have a second interview someday. But I will let you go very shortly. I promise. But uh, Crowley's perspective on the world is something that a lot of people today. Um, in you know numerous ways, <laughs> kind of kind of object to, um, and yet you know there's so there's there's a lot of things that are interesting about his ideas that obviously you have you know kind of centered your life around. What how do you kind of you know deal with the less than savory aspects of Crowley's uh, perspectives? Oh, I've got friends that have far more unsavory aspects to their <laughs> their life than uh, uh i mean sure yeah yeah but no, but they but they didn't no. live a hundred years ago and and like we, i mean like they, we could dismiss those guys i don't know who they are at all so Crowley wrote a bunch of stuff and people have devoted their lives to it so you know, like like where how, how do you make that work for you oh uh, uh i don't i don't have a problem with it and uh, everything fits with you yeah the the, the had I been alive at the time Crowley was alive, and had I attempted to be a Crowley uh, uh, disciple, I think I would have uh, uh, soon fallen by the wayside. Who do you think would have gotten thrown out first, me or you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're older, so it might have been you, you know, like just because of like, literally chron chronologically. But I think I like. Yeah, I would have. I I feel like I would have created more problems. Just, I guess it would have depended depended on which one of us had more money. Uh, that's probably true. And and like I mean like just like realistically, long. What's your birthday? July eleventh. I thought you were a cancer. Okay, he's a cancer. My wife's asking me your astrological. Uh, <laughs> um. I feel like HB, HB dislikes me in a lot of ways. So I feel like I like as HB as agent of Crowley, probably, uh, and he likes you. So I think I would have been thrown out first. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I think H, uh, like Crowley would have been like, uh, Jason's a dick and has too many ideas, but they're not the, the <laughs> my ideas. So screw him. Um, <laughs> Do you, what what are your ideas that are that are anti Crowley? Like what are what what are your like sort of like things that where you drift like you feel like you're I like Crowley but but this thing that he thinks is not what what I think. Uh, I that's that's a hard one to uh, because there's no quote of Crowley. Cause I can I think feel like I can think of a quote of Crowley that I I disagree with strongly. But but, but I don't you know what, what, is there a, there's nothing that you disagree with. Oh, uh, I could disagree with absolutely every one of them uh, <laughs> in, in, any, in any given situation. Uh, you know, we, we have the disadvantage of having uh, uh, almost 70 years of quotes from Crowley. Sure. Uh, uh, that were crystallized in amber. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, we get to forget about what we said in this interview ten minutes from now. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it's one it's one thing to uh, uh, have a comment or try to understand a comment that was uttered during the Boer War, uh, and a comment that may be uh, uh, uttered. Uh, in uh, 1945. Sure. And uh, the, the, the thing, the thing about I think you and I versus Alistair Crowley is that you, like I don't think either of us want to put forward that we're a prophet in any way. Like whereas that was something he was comfortable with putting on putting on himself. Um, do you do you feel like there are aspects of you where you feel like uh, I actually I am kind of a prophet. You know, like I am I am I am putting forward this stuff in a powerful way that is that is going to change the world fundamentally like do you feel like you're you're a part of that process or or where do you where do you see yourself uh gee i don't uh, 
I only feel like a prophet when uh, anyone dares to disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best answer I've ever had to that, that kind of question, honestly. <laughs> um, so, then my omniscience is... is <laughs> No, but it, the prophet thing is perfect for, for Crowley, okay? Um, a prophet is a very special kind of holy man or holy mm -hmm. person. Prophets don't have to be likable. Sure. Crowley, uh, uh, prophets actually don't have to be wise or they don't have to be saintly. All a prophet has to do to be a prophet is to be consciously aware of a profound shift in human consciousness and have the balls to give voice to that change, no matter what the consequences are to his or her personal life so you and i have both shared information that we think is uh experience uh, valuable if if the you know present day gestapo comes are, are you ready to like you know get put on the cross for <laughs> for, for, what we, for what we think is is right or true or you know like are, how 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 invested are you you ready to like just let it go to not have the Trump people, you know, get you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just hope it, it won't it won't come to that. I mean, like we may avert the situation. <laughs> but... You know, you know, I play the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before before I let you go, let's talk about that. You have you have kind of like in, in the last in the last decade or so, you've you've reinvented yourself. Kind of as a, as a performer doing doing your music again. Do you, do you still play the music that you're playing back then, or is it or is it new music that you that you? Oh, new songs, yeah. What's that? New, new songs. New songs. And do you feel like it's the same kind of like muse that it, that that informed that time, or or are you like a totally different person? And you're like, whoa, I can't believe I did that back then, and this is what I'm doing now. Oh, well, it's uh, uh, I'm the same person, but I mean, every molecule of my flesh has changed. <laughs> you know, seven. I mean, like a lot of times, right? Seven years, it's changed. So this is a number well, of times. Actually, like, your face changes every twenty-four months. So. My wife says your face changes every twenty-four months. So, like, <laughs> you and I, we, you, we, our faces are very different from last time we saw each other. So, uh, like, I mean, you, you are, you, you are. Um, the last time I saw you, you were like, I've just stopped working for the company I was working for, and I'm going to be a full-time lawn. <laughs> and you have, you have clearly succeeded with doing that for the intervening, at least, I want to say at least uh, five years or so, like, you know, like, or more. Uh, so the, the vision that you are bringing forth artistically, because I feel like a lot, of, a lot of who you are is as an artist. Am I wrong in saying that? Yes. Yes, I'd say. Um, where, where do you think that, like, how, do, how, how is the Charlie D and, and Milo person in comparison with the two, 2020 coronavirus, <laughs> like, who, how, how has that transformation changed you as an, as an artistic expressor? Uh, you know, I, I really haven't stopped to uh analyze it uh, my wife is asking like ha, ha, has you know, during okay so in 1970 we have we have the amazing charlie d and milo album that you can find for way more than you'd normally buy an album for but you you could get it if you want it or you can listen to it somewhere on the internet and there's also a couple singles from that you can find various places and then there is Lana Milo Duquette, the artist who has uh, who who has evolved from that 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 space. And what were you asking? I just want to know, like, 
Oh, oh. So, so during the time period when you were in, in sort of like writing the most occult books that you wrote, you know, what I mean, like we, we were talking about, what was that 1990 something that you wrote the first one of those, yeah. um, to 2010 or so, where, you know, where before you were like really kind of like quitting your job and and uh, and and moving on. Like, were you still work? Were you were writing music during that time period? No. You, no. No. No, I uh, I gave up. I sold all my instruments even uh, in wow. 1972 uh, when my son was born, and I didn't pick them up again until uh, about ten years ago. Uh, yeah, a student, yeah. The student gave me a ukulele, and uh, I started like new. Such you're like such a, a, a an avatar of my father. He's like <laughs> literally. My, my, I was born in 1972, the same year as your son was born, and and my father lives in Hawaii, Hawaii and he makes ukulele right now. So it's like, really? Yeah, literally. <laughs> literally. <laughs> so anyway, and and one, like he lived in in San Francisco. Like he and my mom hooked up in San Francisco in 1967. And we're, we're together until like 1974 or so. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you guys would have liked each other for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you guys gotta, you gotta friend each other because you're gonna like. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, he, he, yeah, yeah, he carves, he carves ukulele. Oh, yeah, he's, he's super pretentious about it. ukulele. Um, uh, <laughs> and he, and he likes to talk to me in Hawaiian, like for, for the, oh, uh, what, how do you say? Mecca, Lecca, Hila, you know, like the, there's a way of saying uh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, yeah. yeah. There's a song from the, like, 30s. That Mecca, I, Lecca, Hi, Mecca, Hi. Yeah. Yes, now, now you're getting to Pee Wee Herman territory there. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I, 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 I agree with you. That is all part of the same <laughs> stream. Of so anyway, you, you gave up music for a long time. Yeah. Uh, was it because uh, a cult's writing was paying off, or just you had to no, do it? No, it was uh, uh, Constance became pregnant with our son, and uh, uh, I just knew that uh, uh, a family life and the life of uh, a Hollywood recording artist weren't going to be compatible, uh, especially with my love of excesses. Sure, but but you became a full time lawn at least ten years ago. I want to say. I think it was two thousand five. I think I. It might have been. And uh, and it was very difficult uh, uh, for the first uh, twenty years. <laughs> You're still in that. <laughs> Just, yeah, that's only fifteen years ago. So. <laughs> It's it's always been hand to mouth, but uh, well, I've always had a hand and I've always had a mouth. So sure, and and always and your mouth always says things that are very funny that make people want to give you their money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I mean, like, no, I mean, it is more than that. But like, my wife is saying, no, it's more than that. He's a genius. But um, but but, but like, I mean, <laughs> Juan is very impressed with your. With your opinion, <laughs> um, the she she's a very wise woman, um, but the, I mean, like Lon Lon has, um, he 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 is he is very much the sort of the spokesperson for um, a, a certain dial through Thelema. Like I mean, it's like you're not you're not like all of the Thelemic opinions, but you're like, I mean, absolutely, you're the 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 front man the, <laughs> the lead singer for for a, a certain way of looking at Thelema. What would you call that band? What would I call that band? Um, yeah, the band. Hmm. Mm. Mm. Uh, wow, that's a tough question. She's she's asking me to be creative. So, Lon, what, what would you call that band? Because I'm not gonna. I'm gonna uh, Breakfast. What's that? Caligula's breakfast. Caligula's breakfast. Oh my god! <laughs> All of our children love Caligula. All of our children. She says all of our children love Caligula. I don't. I. I it's not something I'm familiar with, but apparently 
We've watched a lot. We've watched a lot of like people totally torture their communities no. and been super into it. <laughs> my children love Caligula. No, apparently, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Lon, um, in terms. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, so, Lon, in terms of um, your practical magical life. Um, do you feel like there's still things for you to learn or do you feel like you're kind of, you know, just yeah. sharing at this point? Yeah, no, there's, uh, I, I think uh, most of my learning is still ahead of me. Most of your learning is ahead of you. Ooh, that's a, that's, I that's very, that. uh, I mean, that's a very, that. you know, I, I hope that most of my learning is ahead is of me. Is he only in his 60s? How old are you, Lon? No, if wants to know. Like, apparently, she wants to hug up with you. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of I was born in 1948. 40? Oh, yeah. you're, you're literally so, one year older than my mom. All right. So, so definitely have to see why you would say that. Because the best years are ahead of things. Okay. So, my wife says that literally she can see why that is because she thinks the best my, years my are ahead of things. <laughs> and of course, her her grandmother is ninety three years old and still alive. So that's like she's she's got a different perspective than some people do who live to like forty eight and then they die. But, but <laughs> you're clearly uh, moving forward. So uh, where do you see the future of the Ordo Templi Orientis before we before we stop this interview? Where do you, where do you see that moving? Forward? It's 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 unclear to me at uh, at the moment. The pandemic. Uh, uh, has thrown a monkey wrench into any kind of organization that yeah. uh, 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 depends on uh, sort of face-to-face, hands-on uh, uh, initiations. Uh, but even without the pandemic, do you, do you see that the, the, the like uh, um, initiatory kind of experiences are, are actually, because like a lot of young people see things that like you, you and I would never have seen in our lives just based on like they look at you know TikTok or YouTube and they see stuff that like is shocking or <laughs> transformative that that you like that would be if you were initiated into something and you saw those images or you saw those concepts it would transform you in a way that was amazing but um, that's like kind of available to everybody in, in some ways, like where, where do you see initiation in, in 2020? I, I see, uh, uh, I've already, you know, I've got the, the, the chicken Kabbalah and those three degrees of Kabbalah initiation in Son of Chicken Kabbalah. And I've put those, on, uh, those initiations uh, the, as best I can, those initiatory experiences uh, on uh, Zoom presentations like what we're, uh, we're doing here. And I've uh, been able to uh, at least direct and control the uh, like uh, PowerPoint full screen uh, presentations along with uh, uh, officers talking back and forth. And uh, it's, a, it's a virtual self-hypnotic sort of uh, uh, experience, but so is a temple, a brick and mortar temple initiation is also uh, a variety of hypnotic experience. And so I, I, I do see uh, that initiation as a, as a formula, uh, I see a future for it being applied in a virtual in a virtual way that can be as uh, uh, profoundly uh, effective as uh, <clears throat> taking part in the rites of Eleusis. You sure. know? Uh, well, uh, uh, l let me break in here. So when, when I was a, um, a younger man and um, the internet was younger <laughs> and you and I didn't know each other as well, I was on a I was on a group that there was an OTO leadership group, and there was a guy who was like, "Oh, people should have to work harder for their initiations than they have to." And I said, uh, "No, I mean the initiations are are written as they are. That you don't have to do work harder than they are. The, the initiations are what they are." It, but 
the 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 essence of his of his concept I, I i wasn't totally opposed to which is that you know people need to there needs to be a reason for why you are seeking a transformative experience do you do you feel like it's possible to really even have those experiences or are we you know do we know like uh, all the secret words and all the gestures and all the you know, steps that are involved in ritual have, have really been revealed at this point. And if they haven't, if you want to find them, I, I don't want to, you know, cast dispersion on it, but you can find them. Like, you know, they're, they're out there. You can, if you search it up, you can find everything that, you know, Lon and I have been through in terms of the initiations that were designed by Crowley, that, that were designed by the, you know, the people before Crowley, that design, you know, going all the way back to the beginning of time. You know, like, you can find all that. That's all out there, and you can find it in five minutes. Much faster than Lana or I could ever have found it when we were when we were getting started. Like so much faster, you know. Like they, like they, you know, and the in the and the sort of uh, definition of what uh, the expression of what those uh, initiations meant. You can find the people who you find a you know ten thousand people who have a different opinion on that. Some of them who say, "Oh, this is how it transformed me forever," and some of them who say, "This is why it's just." stupid nonsense that no one needs to deal with right all you know like, all initiation is self-initiation all of it's self-initiation and uh the type of initiatory experience that uh uh, uh is suggested uh in the aa uh is a totally different kind of initiatory experience than is uh, uh provided by the masons or the golden dawn or the, or or the oto so it's it's all uh, uh, self initiation, and uh, we mentioned that we both both were uh, I love to go to movies, mm -hmm. and movies and plays and uh, and concerts and things like that are only effective in so much as they they uh, uh, project they evoke. Uh, a change of consciousness in the in in the observer. Absolutely. So the uh, in the same way that uh, uh, the maybe archaic Shakespeare plays, uh, which were performed very crudely on a very uh, small stage, can be uh, with, can with with crazy people in the front row throwing stuff. <laughs> like literally, literally. <laughs> can be uh can be amplified uh in a in a major motion picture and then and then played on uh on television uh affecting a change in consciousness in maybe a million people mm -hmm. absolutely and, but out of those million people that that see that maybe five people actually have the the hoped for transcendent change of consciousness that that uh, initiation could provide that's about the same odds that you get with people joining occult orders too and, and, and do you, is that is that enough and and is that like i mean i feel like so many people who join things want to have something other than a transformation towards, you know, a higher well, consciousness. Then uh, uh, they get what they do get out of the the uh, experience, and we keep the dues. <laughs> I feel that very, very, very enlightened and practical at the same time. So, <laughs> uh, it's, truly not, it's truly not up to us. Uh, to, to micromanage their uh, their growth or whatever their processing yeah. of yeah. the of experience. Uh, the best we can do is uh, 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 provide the ex the standardized experience, and then get out of the way of the effect of that experience on on the individual candidates. <laughs>